This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon and uh, aloha to everyone. Uh, this is another episode of Hawaii's Living Legend Lawyers. The show is presented by the Hawaii State Bar Association, of which I am the current president for this year. And also uh, with deep gratitude to Think Tech, we are airing these programs. Um, my guest today is Mr. Eric Seitz. Uh, we have half an hour to go over a lifetime, almost 50 years in the courtrooms battling for the underdog, for the underprivileged, for those who have been uh, on the receiving end of some very difficult and onerous uh, social policies. Mr. Seitz has taken on cases that no one else would take. Um, I want to welcome you, my old friend, my good friend, Eric, welcome to the program. Thank you. All right. So, you know, I know that a couple of years ago you were interviewed in another program in which you went through your entire, uh, well, not your entire, but most of your life history and your family and so forth. I'd like to get into some of that, but not all of it. Um, unlike many individuals who go into the law because uh, uh, they, they have a point of view that are different from their family members, some becoming very liberal in their outlook in a time, at a time when you started practicing law where, where individuals were from families that have very conservative values and thoughts. You came from a different kind of background, didn't you? I did. My, um, my parents were, were involved in uh, very significant political movements in the 1930s uh, and after that. Uh, in the 1950s, they were targeted uh, by the McCarthy uh, period and had to move from New York to California. Uh, my sister actually was physically attacked by other kids uh, who were incited to do so uh, by the parents of some of her classmates. So we had some pretty rocky times and uh, it was a very tumultuous period of time before uh, finally when I got to high school and things began to calm down. For many of those years, my father was unable to obtain or keep employment. Uh, but they nevertheless were very principled people. They always uh, kept to their principles. They were known to uh, basically invite all kinds of stray people home and to befriend uh, people uh, of all different kinds. And uh, they were pretty remarkable and very principled people. Uh, and even though I tried to rebel against some of that, it was pretty hard to do because uh, they were pretty unique uh, in the way that, uh, that they dealt with social issues in their times. Well, you know, in, in your case, the apple did not fall far from the tree. Uh, you grew up in Manhattan, is that correct? Well, actually, yeah. I spent the first seven years in New York. Uh, and then, uh, as a consequence of the McCarthy period, my parents had to move, so they moved to California. So, actually, pretty much my upbringing in school, elementary, intermediate school, and then high school, was in uh, Palo Alto, California. Something I learned about you, having known you for decades now, I, I didn't know that uh, your father had actually worked with the, um, pres I guess, President uh, Roosevelt and followed by President Truman in the Japanese Relocation Authority Program. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, most people don't realize that in the wake of the internment uh, program, which was, of course, horrible, um, the government at least had the good sense to anticipate that the Japanese who were in turn would be coming home at some point. And so early on in the war, uh, they created the, the uh, Japanese Relocation Authority, which was based in New York City. And they hired a number of people, including my dad, who was a housing specialist, to travel around to meet with uh, Japanese families in the camps on the West Coast, and then to assist them in uh, going back home and uh, regaining their homes and their farms. And uh, it, it was a very dangerous task because in many instances, as soon as the Japanese families left, everything they owned was seized by their neighbors uh, and they didn't want to give it back. Uh, but in many cases, they were able to reintroduce people into mm -hmm. those communities or if not to resettle them elsewhere, primarily on the West Coast. Did your dad ever talk about whether the, uh, the Japanese Americans <clears throat> trusted him? After all, they'd been betrayed by their own country, they'd been... <clears throat> They lost everything they had, had been, uh, they say, relocated. Some people call them concentration camps. Whatever you call it, it was a period that you would understand if there was distrust. Well, you know, when I was growing up in the 50s in Palo Alto, uh, it, it would be a regular occasion, uh, sometimes a couple times a year, when we were just walking down the street and there'd be 
uh, some Japanese people walking toward us, and they would start to cry and grab my father and hug him and tell me how much they appreciated my father because he had come to their rescue and what a hero he was. And okay. it was pretty remarkable for a kid to see people say those kinds of things about one of your parents. Yeah, very moving story. Uh, and your mom was involved as well. My mom uh, was uh, a, 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 an early advocate for, uh, prime, for preschool uh, for children, for working parents. And uh, during the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, in the 1930s, she set up uh, collective childcare programs and it was one of the originators of what we now call cooperative uh, childcare, where parents participate on a basis of a couple of days' time in uh, their child, their children's preschools. And she uh, did that for some 50 or 60 years. Several decades, uh, way ahead of their time. Yeah. And of course, uh, I just recently read that several decades of progress have been rolled back in a matter of months. But we, don't, we won't get into that. I'd like to do a little flyover of your educational background. You went to Oberlin College, which was, even then, I think, considered a very progressive uh, liberal arts college in the Midwest. And uh, you graduated with honors. And then on to Bolt Hall, the University of California at Berkeley. And um, you got your law degree there, right? Correct. Okay. Tell us about uh, what you did during and right after law school. Well, uh, in law school, I um, became very quickly enmeshed in all the political things that were going on in Berkeley. And actually, two months into law school, I received a notice from my draft board that I was uh, uh, being called uh, to service in Vietnam. Uh, and that propelled me to become an expert on selective service law so that I could uh, protect myself but I eventually went on to uh, work with a lawyer in San Francisco, and we counseled and represented, while I was in law school, uh, close to 1,000 people. Uh, so that's primarily what I did in law school. In addition, uh, when I got to uh, the University of California Law School, I discovered that there was a student chapter of what was then called the National Lawyers Guild. The National Lawyers Guild was an organization founded in 1939 as a progressive alternative to the American Bar Association. Uh, and it represented and worked with many of the lawyers who were active in the 50s uh, in anti-McCarthy activities. And I had heard about that uh, by virtue of my parents' political contacts and ties. So I was drawn to that organization, and I became a member of the student chapter as soon as I enrolled in law school. I eventually became the president of the student chapter. And then I became the, one of the first five student members of the National Executive Board of the organization. And my first job out of law school, I was hired to go to New York to run the organization as the National Executive Director, and I did that for two years. Amazing. So you counseled about 1,000 young people. I imagine most of them were, were they college students? Some were college students. Uh, they were all different kinds of people from the Bay Area. Um, we had a very active... Uh, and very creative way to represent people. And, uh, you know, we were very successful because we were very aggressive and the draft boards simply didn't know what to do with us. So uh, it was a very uh, unique kind of opportunity. And then, unfortunately, we discovered that it didn't really slow down the recruitment process. It just meant that uh, the draft boards would find ways to draft other people, um, unfortunately, poor people or non-white people who didn't have access to lawyers to protect them. And so from that experience, I gradually moved more into representing people in the military, and that became a specialty which I pursued for many years. I've seen a film. I don't recall the name of it, but I've seen a film in mm -hmm. which uh, you were, maybe it's a cameo. I don't want to say that you were the star oh, of the film. No, I had a speaking line, <laughs> two lines. <laughs> but you were, um, you were in overseas in Japan, I believe, and uh, you were among uh, a numerous young men, I think, and there were no women at that time in the military, at least not in the position that these young men were in. Uh, some of them were African-American. Others uh, were clearly identifiable as minorities. And I was wondering, what in the world is this guy with long, dark hair and a beard uh, doing in this movie? Um, could you tell us about that? Well, uh, while I was working in New York for the National Lawyers Guild, uh, we were getting an increasing number of calls and, and correspondence from people in the war zone or adjacent to the war zone who were involved in anti-war activities and who wanted representation and advice. 
So in 1971, we decided to set up an office in Asia. We wanted to set it up in Vietnam, but we were prohibited mm -hmm. from doing that. So we set it up in the Philippines, from which the air war was being fought. All the ships were coming in, all the aircraft carriers and so forth, and in Japan. And we traveled from there to Okinawa and Korea and Thailand and also to Vietnam to represent uh, clients who were involved in primarily anti-war activities. And so after setting up that office, which I did uh, in the latter part of 1971, I went there as one of the first staff attorneys from 1971 to 72. Right. Well, you know, you've been um, in the midst of several celebrity uh, law legal cases. I know, I know that you're involved with the Chicago 7. Some of the viewers might not know what that is. I'd like you to talk about that. And I have memories of seeing you with, uh, well, maybe not seeing you with, but I think it might have been with uh, Jane Fonda, uh, also um, uh, Mr. Kunstler from the um, you know, well-known attorney during the 60s, almost everyone knew who he was, and Charles Gary. Uh, give us a little bit of background of your, your connection with these people. Well, when I was at the Lawyers Guild, um, the Chicago conspiracy trial started literally the day that I got there. And uh, on that first day, we got a call that four lawyers had been arrested because Charles Gary had gotten uh, sick, had a gallbladder operation, wasn't able to show up for trial, and there was all this turmoil. So I was immediately on a plane to Chicago the first day I worked in order to deal with the crises around this trial. And I did that for the entire duration of the trial. I was sort of the person who put out fires. Uh, I also traveled with many of the defendants uh, when they would go to speak, or, and I would set up speaking engagements at law schools uh, to popularize what was happening in the courtroom for people who were interested and who were drawn to that. Uh, during that time, my job also consisted of going around the country and recruiting and training lawyers to represent people in the Black Panther Party, uh, of whom uh, Bobby Seale was Bobby Seale and yeah. and uh, and a number of other people, and uh, so I was very close to them and was involved in all of the cases involving uh, the Black Panthers and the Black Panther leadership. Uh, Charles Gary was really a mentor of mine. Actually, he had helped to get me the job uh, with the National Lawyers Guild. Uh, Bill Kunstler was a colleague. Um, we worked on a number of things together, and in 1989. Uh, we both represented Leonard Peltier, who's a, a very famous uh, Native American who was convicted of uh, murdering two FBI agents. And Bill and I worked very closely together that, on that case until he died. Um, so I've had the wonderful opportunity to work with some of these legendary lawyers, watch them in operation, uh, work with them and be mentored by them. And uh, it, it's been a pretty remarkable experience. You know, I, uh, before we take a break, I need to tell you that uh, before you even spoke to me about representing Mr. Peltier or Leonard Peltier, I bought a book that was titled In the Spirit of Crazy Horse, the first edition, and then it went off the market. I mean, uh, right. it was banned, and, and I thought, wow, I have something of a collector's item. It's a very moving and poignant um, uh, story by, well, not a story, it's a true uh, report by Mr. Peter Matheson, a famous uh, author, and um, eventually, I'll tell the listeners, I gave you the book and you got it signed for me. Well, in addition to that, uh, after I got involved in the case, we resurrected it, there is a, a second printing, uh, it, which is a uh, soft cover printing. And the uh, appendix to that talks about all the activities that I was involved in, which uh, uh, Mr. Matheson participated in as well. Okay, I think we're about due for a, a little break here. So um, uh, we'll come back after the break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Glob. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea 
is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Thank you and welcome back to Living Legend Lawyers Hawaii. Uh, we're with Eric Seitz. I'll get right into the next question I wanted to ask you. Uh, so Mr. Seitz, um, how do you decide whether or not you represent someone? By that I mean, I know you have an overflow of people who want your services and <coughs> there must be some criteria you use to determine who you're going to be representing. Well, you know, we don't have a website, we don't advertise, but we get probably 20 to 30 people a week who contact us either by email or letters or calls wanting us to assist them or advise them or represent them. Uh, typically, we take cases where we think that we can make some sort of a difference. We take cases where we think uh, that what's happening to the people involved uh, is something uh, which uh, concerns us uh, mm -hmm. and where we believe that uh, we can be of help to them. And in many instances, there are cases that no one else is going to take on, so we're sort of uh, the court of last resort. So, you know, most of the cases and most of the work we do is uh, essentially directed toward doing whatever we can to help people who are in very often desperate need, who can't get help elsewhere, and whose cases hopefully uh, have some meaning and significance beyond just the individuals who are directly involved. All right. This might be a, a tough question <coughs> for, it's more difficult for me to ask than for you to answer, I suppose, but um, you know, clearly everyone knows that, uh, and if they didn't, they know by now that you've been identified as a very liberal individual, very progressive, as a civil rights lawyer, would you represent someone who espoused or had a very conservative cause or very reactionary cause uh, or a point of view? Generally not. Uh, I mean, I certainly wouldn't represent Nazis. I wouldn't represent uh, uh, people who uh, have uh, views that uh, involve hating other people or segregating or punishing or harming other people. Uh, I just don't see any reason to represent those kind of people. They could have the worst things in the world happening to them, but as far as I'm concerned, let them go find lawyers elsewhere. That's not how I want to spend my limited time. I basically want to um, represent people who I think uh, deserve my representation and with whom I can uh, basically uh, form some sort of a bond as to what's happening to them and, and why we should be assisting them. You know, there's so many cases. Uh, we could spend hours talking about your most <laughs> memorable cases, I'm sure. Um, I'd like to ask you about just one, and I've selected it. I know that there's several that are close to your heart. Uh, the Felix Consent Decree, can you tell us about that and your role in obtaining what you achieved, which is quite remarkable? Well, it started back in 1989, I believe, when I first represented Jennifer Felix, who at that time was a 14-year-old girl on Maui who had some very severe uh, physical and emotional disorders. Uh, and was spending almost all of her time at school locked in a bathroom because they didn't know how to deal with her. And uh, they had no facilities and no programs. And moreover, when we got involved in the case, we found that the state, although it was taking federal monies to provide programs mandated by federal law, just wasn't doing it. So individually, I represented uh, uh, Jennifer, and we eventually got a court to order that she be placed into a special program in Texas where she just thrived. Uh, and then eventually she, it was time for her to come back and there was nothing for her here. She came back and she was put in a program in Waipahu which we had actually carefully designed but it didn't work because there were some major flaws in the way the program was operated by the Department of Health and the Department of Education. And at one point she uh, walked away from the program, was out on the streets of Waipahu and was sexually assaulted. Uh, and it was just a horrible event to occur, especially as far as we'd come with her. So at that point, uh, a number of organizations were forming, and they were going to the legislature in 1992 uh, to make demands on the legislature to fix these problems and appropriate enough money to do what the state was federally mandated to do. Nothing more, nothing less. And they went to the legislature, and they made their demands, and the legislature didn't give them the time of day. So they came to me, and uh, there were, I guess, originally five lawyers, 
who put together a class action lawsuit in behalf of all of the disabled students in Hawaii who are entitled to some sorts of federal programming uh, for their disabilities. First, uh, first lawsuit, first class action of its kind, and you prevailed. Yes, yeah. we did. It took us uh, about a year and a half, and we won a motion mm -hmm. for summary judgment as to liability, after which the state then decided they had to negotiate with us. We then spent the next three years putting together a plan for them to uh, incorporate Again, just what the federal law already required of them. And eventually we put together a plan that was somewhat remarkable and set out to implement it. The entire process took, ultimately was supposed to take five or six years. It ended up taking 12 years. It ended up costing the state an estimated $1.2 billion. But by the end of that time, we had probably one of the best uh, special education and children's mental health uh, systems in the country and we did that at remarkably little expense because one of the other things that we insisted upon was that this wasn't an opportunity for lawyers to make a lot of money we capped our fees we kept our fees way below what we might otherwise have been entitled to get usually in a class action the fees generally run about somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of what the recovery was and if you say 1.2 billion you can figure that out. well in this case the fees were less than $1 million altogether over a 12-year period. And so for economic purposes, as well as uh, because we did this as a, a love, uh, we were able to create an enormous uh, change in the systems in Hawaii. Well stated. Um, you know, two weeks ago, I interviewed uh, Mr. Vernon Toshima, who last week turned 98 years of age. He's still going to court. Um, my question to you is, how long do you expect to practice? Well, uh, I don't know. Um, I think I'm going to practice until uh, hopefully I can find and train other people to do what I do. Uh, and I'm not going to just walk away. I'm going to basically do less and less and have them do more and more. Currently, my practice operates with four associates uh, in whom I repose a great deal of confidence. They're all really skilled lawyers and really good young people. And I think that uh, in due course, they'll be able to do a lot more of what I have to do. And I can just recede and sort of be a senior partner, advisor, mentor uh, while they carry on the work. At least that's my hope. Well, what would you advise uh, young people who are inspired by the kind of work you've done? What, would, what should they do if they graduate from law school and now it's time for them to look for a job? I think, um, you know, it's a very different time now than it was when I started. But nonetheless, I think you just have to go out and do what you want to do. You have to really roll the dice and figure out ways uh, to be able to afford to do uh, the kind of work that you feel dedicated and, and impelled to do. Uh, when I first came to Hawaii, I worked out of my house. I didn't have an office. I had one of these self-correcting selective typewriters and wrote everything on that. Uh, I used commercial copiers. I had a part-time secretary who worked out of her house, who would type briefs when that needed to happen, and I would stay there and watch her kids while she typed. And that was the way I practiced. And I remember, this is back in the 1970s, I was charging $10 an hour, and then eventually it went to $12. And after I won one case in the U.S. Supreme Court, which was kind of unheard of, where we won about $4 million for my clients, I upped my rate to $15 an hour. <laughs> So I've always felt that, uh, you know, doing the work uh, is joyful. Uh, it's uh, got its own rewards. I very often walk down the street, somebody comes up to me and thanks me for something that I don't even remember. It may have happened 15 years ago. And that's just a good enough reason to keep doing that's, it. That's wonderful. I remember my first legal job <coughs> paid $7.48 an hour with no benefits. You know, you and I are both war babies. We were born at the end the tail end of World War II. Uh, you must have had a wonderful childhood as I did. It was a great time to be a child. You, for the first time in your life, I believe, are going to be a grandfather. Is that right? I am. And uh, I know the blessed event is coming up soon. Um, tell us your thoughts about this. Well, uh, you know, my kids uh, have been too busy, I guess, to have kids on their own. And uh, so... But they're now getting around to it. My, my daughter is due to have a baby in July, and my son 
who teaches at Farrington High School, has a wonderful uh, companion who has two kids, and we can't wait for them to get married. I hope they watch this and see that so we can grab those two kids as well because we adore them. So, you know, there are lots of, lots of things going on that, that make I, life uh, very nice. You know, this, uh, your attention has been focused on representing your clients. I know that for a fact. You're, you know, you're the preeminent civil rights attorney in Hawaii and certainly one of the most uh, preeminent in the United States. Um, my congratulations to you and to your wife, Ray. Uh, we'll be getting together soon, I hope. Um, any thoughts that you want to share with our audience uh, before this, this segment is over? Well, you know, these are very difficult times. Uh, many of us are very distressed about the leadership in this country and the political directions in which this country is going. And, uh, you know, I got to tell you, I remember growing up in the 50s during the McCarthy period, and we were desperate about the way things were going. And I remember when Ronald Reagan was elected, and we thought that was the worst possible thing that could happen, and he's going to get us into a nuclear war. Uh, before that, when Nixon was elected, we had similar kinds of concerns, uh, and then George Bush. Uh, so, you know, this is a period of time. Uh, things happen, and you can't lose confidence in your own ability to fight for what's right. You can't just dig a hole around yourself and say, oh my God, it's terrible, it's terrible. You got to go out and, and continue to do what you do to uh, address the issues and uh, hopefully educate and motivate other people. And frankly, I'm very encouraged. Uh, you know, the, the change that's going to come in this country is going to come because of the actions of younger people. And there are lots and lots of younger people who've been motivated to step out and, and take positions and put themselves uh, uh, at risk. And as long as people are willing to do that, uh, no matter what the threats are, no matter how badly things are going, I think there's enormous, uh, enormous reason to be hopeful for the future. Thank you, Eric. Um, Eric Seitz, civil rights lawyer, lawyer of the people, who continues to fight the good fight. Does that sound about right? I like it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for being on the right. show. Thank you. We wish you the best. He has a two. He has an appointment that's going to uh, commence about two <laughs> minutes from now. So I hope you brought your running shoes with you. I'm ready to go. Okay. Thank you very much for tuning in to another session of uh, Living Legend Lawyers of Hawaii. I'm Howard Luke, and thanks for tuning in.